Well, thank you all for coming to the Neurodiversity and Tech Summer Internship Showcase. My name is Pamela Cosman, and I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at UC San Diego. I'm also the director of this internship program. So in a nutshell, what this program is, is that it's nine weeks long, it's half time, it's paid, and we have 15 interns here at UC San Diego, and the same number at our sister program at Northeastern University. This has a competitive application process. We had a lot of people applying across the country for both sites. It's a team-based opportunity, as you're going to see how they work in teams. Um, and it's focused on creation of educational video games. You might ask, why are we doing this? So the context is that neurodiversity, which includes autism spectrum condition, ADHD, learning differences, and other conditions, is a growing population. And it has very high unemployment, particularly for people on the spectrum. But a lot of companies are realizing the advantages of welcoming neurodiverse employees. So in part, it's clear that if you broaden opportunities, you're going to get more people in the, in the workforce with different views. But in particular, there's advantages to having diverse groups with different kinds of talents and perspectives and creativity. The need as we see it is for training on durable hard skills and tools for tech jobs, and also on soft skills needed for employment. But this is a two-way street. It's not that we're just saying that neurodivergent um, but potential workers need to improve, improve their workplace skills, but also employers need certain changes to their hiring and retention processes. You might also ask, why video games? So for one thing, they're fun. Um, it's a common interest also for young people. Um, and particularly, people on the spectrum are overrepresented in the game industry. So it's one of the few sectors where neurodivergence really seems somehow to fit um, what's going on in that industry. There's also a range of skills needed. So it's not just programmers, but we also need digital artists. We need designers. We need project coordinators. We need people with a variety of different skills. And also, this can almost fit in the course of nine weeks over the summer. The project is funded by the, a California Workforce Development Grant and also by the National Science Foundation through their Future of Work program. It also concerns the internship, but there's other elements as well. So we've been developing some tech tools. So there's a virtual reality mock job interview that allows people to practice uh, answering difficult questions. Um, there's a project on analysis of gaze behavior and body orientation during these kind of interview conversations. There's also a component on ethics and policy. Um, this has focused on personality tests for hiring screening. So this is a big business um, on, on having personality tests um, that, are, that are used as part of a hiring process. And they can really have a very adverse effect in terms of screening out neurodiversity. There's an education component to this on professional development and also a study of family, community, and coaching support for the interns. And lastly, we do quantitative and qualitative program evaluation um, to modify and improve the internship over time. Each intern team has an artist, a designer, two programmers, and then a fifth person who could be a project manager, a sound designer, maybe both of those, and maybe have some other roles on the project. The interns are supported by coaches who work with them every day on workplace processes, project management, uh, art, coding, game design. And this year, we were fortunate to have three excellent um, coaches that you'll be seeing momentarily. Then there are the clients um, who specify the game concept and the goals. So this gives the interns the opportunity to be responsive to a client with being ac accountable to that person's goals and concept for, for the game while also inserting their own creativity um, and, and ideas into it. We have some game industry mentors who generously donate uh, their time to give technical advice and general professional advice to our interns. And this has been uh, Matt Lewandowski uh, from Team 2-Bit and also three independent, uh, three, um, 
three mentors from the company Ubisoft, um, which is a, a top 10 uh, game company. Oh, lost my place here. Okay. So they're faculty and graduate students on the project um, who are in charge of the research on tech tools and ethics on the internship model. Um, and also program evaluators who do the pre and post surveys. The internship elements include certain workplace practices and tools which are for all teams. So there's JIRA software on project management that you're going to hear about, Discord as a communications platform, and then Git uh, as a content repository so that people can learn about version control. Also we have two programmers on each team so they can learn about peer programming. And then there's certain technical skills that are going to be different by different teams and roles depending on the project and the role. Some interns are learning Unity uh, as a development environment. They might be learning Adobe Photoshop or Figma or Audacity or other kinds of tools. And then there are the lunch and learn sessions, which are on professional development, which cover things like the importance of first impressions, building resumes, teamwork skills, time management, and so forth. And all of these different elements come together to make a game. So at this point, I would like to call up our first team, the expiration date. Uh, please come on up. And while you're coming up, let me introduce the coach for that team, Amkar, if you want to stand up. Amkar Bope uh, is a current uh, graduate student in computer science who has been coaching this team. Also, let me take this moment to remind you, please, to silence your phones. And also, uh, during the Q&A session, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the, the microphone there in the audience, uh, if you have a question. Also, for people who are on the live stream, uh, you can type questions into the chat. And we have someone in the audience who will come up and read your questions into the microphone. All right. All right. Um, so our team is the expiration date team. Uh, my name is Rowan Fremont, and I'm currently attending Mesa College. Um, my ultimate career goal is to be a 3D animator and designer, and I'm an emotional, emotional support human to my cat, Little Kitty. Hi, I'm Marcus Coleman. I'm going to Southwestern College in the fall. I am planning on becoming a special education teacher, hopefully specifically in an autistic only <laughs> classroom. And I enjoy studying quantum mechanics. Oh, wait, let me step up to the mic. Let me Thank you. Me. Do I need to read these? If you want. Okay. I think it's fine. Um, yeah. it's, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Hi, my name is Erica Rice. I'm one of the programmers for Expiration Date, and I graduated Phi Theta Kappa for Palomar College this last June. Um, I'm currently an NFAR cyber participant, and I'm an aspiring cybersecurity specialist. Hi, my name is Miriam Salem. I am one of the programmers. I am currently obtaining a BA in computer science. I currently go to Grossmont Community College, and I am hoping hoping to transfer to UCSD. Hello, I am Jacob Walcher. I am a rising sophomore at the University of San Diego, and uh, I am interested in cartooning, creature design, evolution, and paleontology. So the concept for our game was to create something uh, that where we could study player and AI interaction. Uh, the player needed to engage, utilize, and collaborate with AI. Um, and our team specifically uh, explored AI's educational role in games. What we came up with was an inter interactive fiction game where players collaborate with the AI to make progress. They ask the AI, named Ghost, in-game uh, questions, and then they come up with a password deduced from the information gained from Ghost. So when programming this game, we actually used two different types of programs. React was used to program the game itself, but Langchain was actually used to implement the AI. 
And the thing about ChatGPT is that it derives its data from the internet as a whole. So when asking different questions and making comments about the scenes up there, um, it would provide answers that, for example, um, just about crows in general instead of the crows specifically in the game. So we had to import specific facts and statements about the game itself and then weigh that data more heavily than the data that it gets from the internet. So what that would look like in the processing aspect is that the user would type in their query within the React.js website. Then that would go through Langchain and the AI would respond in the form of full English, English sentences. So for example, the player could ask, what is the crow holding? And the AI would respond with, it is holding a stick. Expiration date is formatted as a slideshow mystery style game where players search for clues within a scene. They are trying to figure out, out the passcode, passwords, excuse me, which will get them to the next level. Some components which the game needs are the password box, the next and the back buttons, which let you go to the next scene or the back to the previous, and the display of the next level scene. The player will single click to open the ghost box, pins to zoom on objects, and can drag to navigate the different parts of the scene. And in the ghost box, you can type a query and the AI will respond. So, so my role on the team was the artist. And as the artist, it was my job to design the characters, the creatures, and very importantly, all the environments that you would be exploring through for this game. As mentioned, it is a slideshow style game, and much of that involves looking through the environments. So uh, to create the scenes themselves, well, the, the scenes and the characters and the creatures, I drew it all in the free art software Fire Alpaca. Uh, but then after that, I used the, 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 the online website Spline to convert all those arts into uh, more interactive scenes. What I mean by uh, using Spline, again, Spline is, a, is, an, is an online website and allows you to, uh, to 3D model. Um, what I basically essentially did was to create a sort of parallax effect, kind of like the Disney's multiplane camera, is I converted different layer, or I uh, exported different layers of each art separately and made some layers and objects closer to the camera than others. So when you look around, it creates a sense of depth when uh, in an otherwise 2D image. Now, uh, these, these are our uh, NPC game characters. Octavia Miller, a grad student. Daxon Enyo, an intern. Professor Javier Powers, uh, a professor. And uh, the aforementioned Ghost, our AI companion that represents ChatGPT. In our game, their role uh, is to essentially guide you through the game both, both through telling the story and uh, giving hints, essentially. And of course, here are all the sprites they made for every single one. Uh, and I, one of the one of the most important uh, skills that I think went into this project uh, was the world building that we put in. As I've mentioned, I'm uh, interested in things like world building and speculative evolution. Uh, and these are things I mess around with a lot, uh, but I was able to apply these uh, skills to our game, especially in the 27th century environments, as this is a time travel game. As you can see, I made a bunch of speculative uh, creatures for this, uh, and I, of course, made sure to write down a bunch of uh, details about each one, which we entered into the chat GPT, so you could ask questions about them. So I'm the designer, and um, to start the design of the game, we all sort of brainstormed ideas, and my job was to put them together, and then I picked a direction, and I made a preliminary path based on key points that we needed to hit, and uh, I developed some initial connections that were flexible, and then from there, I went to tailor it to our tech. Um, 
I established what was necessary for each to progress the story. Um, and then I looked for ways we could further integrate game features for each level. And then once that was all figured out, I had to communicate it with my team. So I organized each layout uh, visually, and then I would verify that the team could understand it and ensure everyone had access to the resources necessary to do their part. And then we had to rinse and repeat that a few times. Um, but eventually we got to implementation, and that was where we constructed the player's experience of the game and the story at the same time. Uh, I delegated tasks, and I made sure that the goals we set out were reached. And at every step, I thought of how to elevate AI interaction between the player and the AI. Um, and then we came up with the final game. Uh, I frequently used Miro, which is like a collaborative design software. It's similar to an online whiteboard. Uh, it made communicating concepts visually very easy, um, and it really mirrored the interactive fiction style of the game. Uh, on the left, you can see a story map and the corresponding game map on the right, and then there's a little zoom in which shows uh, the assets and the asset names and the interactive uh, objects in each scene and exactly how the player would get to them. This was for an earlier iteration. Um, this is for a later iteration. And it's more simple, but it shows exactly what needs to go where. Uh, there's even the names of the scenes are hyperlinked to the spline assets. And I put in the prompt and password for our programmers to access, and everyone had access to this, so everyone could look at it and know everyone else's part in their part. Hi, once again, I'm Marcus Coleman. I was the project manager for the game. I used my time productively to manage the team's project through JIRA, as well as learned about generative AI personally through a course on LinkedIn Learning. How do we move this? Just hit this button. Mm -hmm. So to learn more about JIRA, we, it uses sprints as a form of a weekly system to keep track of tasks. There, to go more in depth, we have a image right up below that, such as a to-do list, an in-progress, a quality assurance, and a done list. For the to-do list, you'll start off by listing your tasks under the to-do list that you plan on completing for the week. Once the task has been initiated, you'll, in, you'll move the task to the in progress. Then, once you have completed the task, but it has yet to be checked over, you move it to quality insurance, where you will have someone else check over your, in this case, a slideshow. Then, once you have, once quality, quality assurance has been passed and the object that is being worked on has been completed fully, you move it to the done task where it is all completed. We would like to acknowledge the ND Tech Director, Professor Pamela Cosman, as well as client Dr. Lisa Hardy at the Concord Consortium, our coaches Amkar Bihope and Emmett Findley, and Jason Gregory at Naughty Dog Studios. Any questions? Please stand if you have a question. Why did you ch choose ChatGPT over Bard? I believe programmers, can you answer that? I do not know the full answer. It was assigned to us, really. Um, the very beginning of the project, we were told to implement a chat GPT into a mystery game. Hi, a couple questions. Uh, so first of all, is this working? Yes. So, all right. Uh, so first of all, um, so whenever you put uh, people in front of chat GPT, they're going to test the limits of it, ask it you know, bizarre, irrelevant, inappropriate questions, whatever. So I'm wondering, how does uh, your game deal with that? 
We actually programmed it to respond to many different types of stimuli, even different unrelated game questions. And how it would respond is it would either reprimand the player, for example, um, using inappropriate language or gently prompt it back to actually playing the game. ChatGPT also has a lot of that already built in. And then also, uh, can you tell us a little more about the 27th century you know, animals, environments? How did you decide what goes in there? Is it aiming for realism, for just fun variety? What, what goes in there? Sure, I'd be happy to explain a little bit. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a, a list here of all, the of all the creatures I made. You can ask all the questions about it to the chat GPT when you play the game. Uh, but we had some lore in mind, uh, which I will not completely uh, tell. Uh, in mind for the game, and based on that, I applied that lore as well as actual scientific knowledge of processes of evolution that I know that could possibly go on within the amount of time between uh, between, uh, between different time periods uh, to uh, to create a uh, a world of, uh, of a, a, an essentially a live feeling world uh, with creatures that made sense for the um, for the world that we were depicting. It was a it was a somewhat messy ecosystem with uh, trees growing around abandoned buildings, so I uh, imagined many of the creatures would probably be uh, uh, built for uh, climbing trees or flying, which is why you'd have like Dentrosaurus, which is a tree climbing a tree climbing monitor, or the regal pouch bird, which uh, can fly, or the dog bat, which also can fly. But we also I also took advantage of uh, niches that could have been. Uh, unfilled in the water. So I had another monitor lizard uh, become Tamasaurus, uh, sort of filling the, starting to fill the role of uh, prehistoric mosasaurs. We have the sprinting monkey, which is uh, one of the only primates left in, in this uh, ecosystem, I imagined. Uh, and it, it has only survived because it is fast, it can climb, and it's smart. Uh, we also, I also imagined some new terrestrial um, niches being filled by birds. We have the brain crow, which is starting to uh, develop uh, human-like intelligence, and the shadow hornbill, which is a nocturnal hunter. I wanted to populate, again, I wanted to populate this world with a diversity of creatures to make it feel, well, more alive, essentially. Okay, so if we could get the second team up here, Bianca's lab. And the coach for this team is Chris Fernando, who's a recent graduate of UC Irvine in computer engineering. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bianca's Lab. My name is Chris Fernando. I'm the coach to this team. I'd like to start uh, by saying how incredibly proud I am of my entire team for all the hard work that they put in through the nine weeks. Uh, each of them uh, contributed in their own very uh, important ways. We have a lot to talk about, so without further ado, I am going to hand the mic to Sarah to start our team introductions. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Shabelli. Uh, I am. Is, is the mic? Is the mic not on? No, it's still there. <laughs> oh, okay. Very good. Oh, great. Can everyone hear me now? No. Oh. <laughs> test test. Oh, that one works. That works. Let me use this one. Yep. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Shabelli. I am a senior at Clemson University in South Carolina. I am a one of the programmers on the team. Uh, James Rackstraw is our sound designer, who you will be meeting in the next presentation. All right. Hello. My name is Derek Hidalgo. I am a senior at Landmark College. I'm taking this internship, and I'm one of the programmers. Hi, I'm um, Luna Martinez. I am the artist, and I uh, study cognitive science here at UC San Diego. 
Hello, I am I'm Jack Griffith. I am uh, currently San Diego Community College District for Electrical Engineering. It might, it's not my final major, but it's just the major I'm trying out. <laughs> yeah, and I was the programmer of the group. Designer, designer, I, oh my God. <laughs> I'm the designer. I I'm terrible at programming. I'm, I'm kind of, I was kind of a. <laughs> and I'm Jay Munger. I was the project manager for the team. I graduated from San Diego State University. Uh, I majored in religious studies. And let's get into it. So the initial concept for our game was for a series of mini games that could be played by very young children at a like a science outreach fair. And these were all going to be based around bioengineering as our client is a bioengineering professor here at UCSD. Um, let's see. Whoops, stop doing that. So the game itself, we looked into a variety of bioengineering concepts. Um, we started looking at different projects done by UCSD faculty. Um, these involved concepts like injectable hydrogels or electronic tattoos, uh, tissue engineering, but we ended up going back to our client's initial suggestion of a hip replacement. So we used the characters of bioengineer Bianca and her robot assistant, Jean, who helped different patients with their prosthetic problems. Um, I ended up doing a lot of the script for this game. Largely, there is a lot of script writing in this, largely because we need the characters to explain different bioengineering concepts to the player. We need the characters to explain like what the actual gameplay mechanics are. And the script needed to be very simple because our game is geared towards five-year-olds. So it needed to be simple, it needed to be understandable, but it also needed to be accurate and fun. Um, the script for the game also needed to be understandable by our programmers, as this was kind of the foundation for the entire game. So any given part of the script might look like this, where each character sprites and when the sprites change is indicated and color-coded, the actual dialogue is in quotations, and all gameplay mechanics and things that the programmers need to keep in mind are written in italics such as right here, we've got a yes, no dialogue option and the different branching paths that the player can choose and go down. The very first scene in our game looks a lot like this. As Bianca shows up on screen and text types, she says, hey there, introduces herself. Her sprite changes from happy to excited. She says, my name is Bianca and this is my lab. All right, this is what we like to call a masterpiece. I made this on Microsoft Paint. <laughs> this is the our concept of uh, what the menu would look like. Um, you got the title. Oh, oh, <laughs> nope, nope. Go back, go back. <laughs> Sorry. So this is we got Bianca on the left. We got the title on the top. We got all the buttons on the side, and uh, that's basically how I thought of the menu was going to look like. This is like the new loadout layout of it. Like the the, the title's on the left. Bianca's still on the left. I didn't draw her this time because I thought it wouldn't be that. Good, I have an idea to draw her again. <laughs> and then you got all the buttons on the right. And this looks kind of the same. This is the final one. We got the title on the top, which we went back to. We got Bianca's a little bigger on his left, which is nice. Um, we got the start button a little bigger because that's the more important button. You got all the other buttons on the bottom, and, and they're still pretty cool. The, oh, yeah, we got this on menu gameplay. It starts with the infection control. Then you... Uh, Clean the table, and then you gotta move things carefully, and you gotta just don't wanna touch those maze walls. They're pretty bad. <laughs> broken bones that need to be removed and replaced, and you gotta put the broken piece into the trash. And then you, after that, you got the prosthetic that needs to fit in. You gotta choose the right size and the right shape. All right, this is another masterpiece I drew. This is the maze, and this is the one we used as our final project maze. This is how uh, our artist decided to design it, and I, I actually enjoy it more than my design. And what you want to do is uh, you want to like drag it all the way for that maze. It's going there. Don't worry. 
you know, and then basically don't want to touch those walls. There's a little path to help you. And then, yeah, you're in the finish. And then you win. All right, this is what our old loadout of the game screen was be. Just this one empty room, just with one dirty table in there when a light switch. And then this is the final one our artists decided to draw. I, I, I like it a lot, and it actually represents the, the labs that you see in the, the camp on the inside the bioengineering building down here at UCSD. It's you got like all the bear, you got the, a statue out there, you got all the tables and all that look like the bio tables. And I'm actually going to pass it down to the artist right now. Hello. Um, so we took a trip down to the bioengineering building here at uh, UC San Diego, and we wanted to get a better view of how exactly it worked and what was present at a bioengineering lab, because frankly, we had no clue. And I applied these learnings to... Uh, various kind of assets that I made from overall visuals to better learning of how bioengineering as a whole works. Um, and I applied this learning to, can you go back over there? Sorry. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> and I applied these learnings to uh, what's called the actual assets. And I also applied the designer's sketches to kind of form the final project, the final um, result, as well as what exactly, you know, things are going to look like in what the program is needed to make the game. The client mentioned a potential expansion for other age groups in the future or kind of as a outreach tool for the university itself. So I took a lot of inspiration from the UC San Diego branding guidelines due to their very kind of pro their prominence in the uh, bioengineering field in general. And I ensured that the visual for the game were consistent and kind of attractive and catchy for the core audience of the game, which was five-year-olds, which was very new to us because never has there been an audience, well, a target audience that young in the history of this internship. So it was kind of a challenge for me to design things that were both attractive and also just kind of caught the attention of five-year-olds. This is the uh, robot assistant that we were talking about, Keen. On the left was his original design that I designed, which was just kind of looks like a happy face and looks kind of bland. And on the right is his final design, which looks a bit more happy and pops out a bit more. Um, this is the patient that you help out, which is supposed to be a side character, but I still gave him a lot of love. And then finally you have Bianca, which is the game's main character. Um, she was created to be very empathetic and show quite a bit of emotion because you know, five-year-olds need to kind of be nudged on what direction, on what to feel, and what exactly is a good thing they did or a bad thing they did, or et cetera. So I designed her to be very expressive. And to tie it all together, I created a font for this game because we had a, we ran into an issue during uh, the creation of this game where we would kind of come up with a very, we would find a very good pixelated font, and it would either have no documentation on copyright or every single website we visited said, if you use this on anything other than a personal computer, you will be sued. Obviously, it's not the case, but better safe than sorry. So I made this font. And for people who like sans serif, I, I mean, just serif, I also made a serif version. And I'm going to try to put this in the actual files of the game if you want to use it for your computer. I don't know. Um, I will pass it on to the programmers now. All right, so this is a basic. Oh, <laughs> all right. Um, this is a basic flowchart on how the game's supposed to work. Um, when the game runs, you start out in the main menu. You can either change, you can either just go right into the game, or you can click on the settings to change the volume. Um, when you click on start, you'll be put into an intro cutscene where you can either listen to Bianca's introduction of the game, or you can skip it and go right into the mini games, which I will let Derek explain. All right, so for the mini games, we have two main ones. We have maze and we have matching. Both of them use the drag and drop mechanic, which involves moving objects on the screen to fulfill certain goals. For the maze, the purpose was to get to the end of the maze without touching the walls, and the walls reset it if, they, if you touch the walls. And then for the, ma for the matching game, we're trying to have the broken piece of the bone be put in the trash and then have the prosthetic piece replace it and be attached to the bone. 
and then you can only have the the prosthetic attached to the bone after you've thrown away the broken piece of the bone first. And also, the bone has different shapes depending on the game, what you're playing. It'll change with each playthrough. It's random each time. And here is a video of it being, being played. As you can see, you can't attach it to the bone, the wrong one. But the right one can be attached. And it goes into the level. All right. And this is the table cleaning mini game that I created. The way it works is you pick up the cloth from the tool tray, and then when you right-click on the dirt spots, it cleans the table. And once you do that, you can go on to the next mini game. I cr did most of the programming for this one. The tool tray, there are multiple tools, because originally we wanted to create other mini games where you could use tools. Like we had an idea where you could pick up some gloves from the tool tray to put them on before you start cleaning, but we eventually had to scrap that idea. And it was, one of the harder mini games to create because there's a lot more moving pieces to it. And I think the end product is just really great. And this is our settings menu. Um, this was also one of the harder pieces to do surprisingly and it was just volume control. Uh, for the settings menu, we had to create an audio manager that keeps a list of all the music and sound effects for the game and what this audio manager does is, is it controls when a certain sound gets played or stopped, and it's connected to the volume sliders that controls the volume of every single sound in the list. Um, this is actually probably one of the hardest things I had to do because we ran into issues where scene changes would play the wrong sounds or it just wouldn't change the volume correctly. But it was a great challenge to overcome, and it really taught me just a lot about UI elements in, in video game design. And now, I'd like we'd like to thank our coach Chris Fernando for helping us through creating our own game, and we'd also like to thank our client, uh, Professor Alyssa Taylor Amos, for um, just commissioning this game to us and giving us the chance to create an educational video game for kids to play. And uh, now we will take any of your questions. Can you tell me a little more about uh, how you target for five-year-olds? So for example, how do you decide uh, what words are too complicated to use? So some of the words we needed to use regardless, like it's a little difficult to make a game about bioengineering without using the word bioengineering. Part of it was because we knew that the goal was to have this played at like a science outreach fair, we figured there would be an adult running the game with a computer able to answer questions and probably a parent or some other guardian figure who could read aloud and help the kid understand what words might be a bit too big. But the simplification really came in explaining the bioengineering concepts and being very clear and direct with how the actual gameplay was supposed to work. It's always saying to left click or right click so that they didn't get confused. Um, explaining things like sterile. We might understand it as sterile means that it is perfectly medically clean, no germs, nothing. For a kid, I just said sterile means it's really, really clean. We did not get a chance to actually like get a five-year-old to play it. We don't know a ton of five-year-olds ourselves. Um, <laughs> the gameplay has mostly been played by adults. Um, they all seem to get it. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was different for like us adults play testing the game. Like I tried to speed run it. it <laughs> People have a chance to play the games after this these presentations. Yeah. So you can give it a shot yourself. Let's get uh, Emmett Finlay up as our 
coach. Uh, and uh, a big thank you to Emmett here, uh, who's not only the coach for this team, but also the program coordinator. So come on up, next team. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, these interns have worked extraordinarily hard, and I am so proud of everything that they have to present. Um, and I will turn it over to my team, and we look forward to letting all of you guys play all three of the games in the room next door to the theater um, as soon as our presentations are complete. Hello everyone, my name is Axis Famalant. I was the artist for our team. I go to Mount Holyoke. I'm in the class of 2025 as a psych major. Go Green Griffins. Um, I use any pronouns and my favorite Pokemon is Wooper. Hi, I'm James. I was a sound designer. Uh, my major is sustainability and I go to San Diego State. Hello, my name is Joshita Muthukrishnan. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I go to NC State University where I'm a senior in computer science game development and I was one of the programmers on this team. Hi, I'm Isabel Merced Galindo. I'm Puerto Rican and Mexican. I use she, her pronouns and I will be attending the University of Southern California um, in three days. Woo. And unfortunately, our other program is not here with us today. Um, his name is Ronald G. And he is actually right now attending the University of California, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So what is Hugh Hunt? Um, Hugh Hunt was the game that we made. It's called Hugh Hunt, A Lighthearted Quest. That's the whole title. And it's about a young boy um, attempting to restore color to the world by solving puzzles based on light physics. Hello. Hello. All right, uh, so our client requested from us a game that would teach the basic principles of light through interactive puzzles, and he wanted us to aim it for eight-year-olds. Uh, for each of our levels, was based off of a different light physics property. Uh, for red, we based it on reflection. Blue was based on refraction, and green was based on total internal reflection. And as for, he also requested a narrative story to link all of these levels together. He wanted something that would, you, the player would be able to emotionally attach with. So I made cuts, I scripted out some cut scenes that would appear between uh, and before each level that would get you connected to the characters, explain so, a bit of the story, and just be lots of fun. So what exactly is reflection, refraction, and total internal reflection? For some of us who have maybe been out of school for longer or just maybe didn't remember this in uh, physics class, um, reflection is uh, when a light beam changes direction at the same angle that it hits it. Refraction is when that light beam enters a denser medium and it will bend, um, so it won't go directly through it. And total internal reflection is when light that is in a denser medium attempts to go out of it, but instead it'll, um, because it's not, um, because it's not going through it at an, an optimal angle, it will just bend right back into that denser medium. Um, in our game, what that means for us is that we had to base mechanics around these three principles of reflection, refraction, and total internal reflection. Um, they either helped you get through puzzles, they were obstacles to puzzles, or they were simply the path that your um, light beam took to get from one end to the other. Thank you. So one of the characters in our game was supposed to be a scientist who accidentally took the color away in the first place. And so when I was designing the characters, I was like, we already have a scientist, and that is our client, Nick. So um, I turned Nick into a little guy. This is the main character's dad. He's a scientist. He's based on Nick. Nick is seeing this for the first time. Sorry, Nick. Um, and Nick has a son himself, so we didn't need to come up with a new son. We just took his son and put him in a little propeller hat. So yeah, now I'd like to talk about um, our first level, which was red. You don't have to play these in a specific order, but red was about um, teleporting, reflecting, and lava. 
Um, when I first uh, understood this, when I first got this assignment, uh, we were trying to get with, we were trying to do something very classic to traditional platforming. So I had to, I draw on paper because I guess I'm old school and I wanted to just sort of picture what our first level would look like. And that for me meant also making it very easy considering this had to be played by an eight year old. And we didn't want to put too many words in the game to read. We wanted people to just get started and get playing. Um, we had to include moving platforms. We had to include a tunnel of mirrors because I think tunnel of mirrors are fun. And also because re mirrors typically remind me of room of mirrors. I wanted to add that in and I thought that would be really fun because we were using reflection in this level. I wanted the light to bounce as many times as possible to show light can bounce as many times as possible. And when designing the perfect first level, I thought of one of the, I think, one of the most brilliant pieces of game design, which is cut the rope. Um, you only have to put one input in in the first level of cut the rope to complete it, um, to finish it to completion. And that's sort of the idea I wanted with our first step in this first level. Um, it's easy. You only need one input, and it very clearly um, shows what the aim of the game is. It's to teleport to these teleporting crystals. Um, it's intuitive. It lights up red. Um, that was sort of the goal with a lot of my design principles was how how can I make this minimal and also how can I make this fun and easy? So this art that you see on the left is my original concept art for the level, just an idea of some props that we could put in there. And then Isabel made the little grayscale map that you can see in the upper right corner to tell me what things she wanted to emphasize in the design, which you can do by making them certain colors, certain shades of darkness and such. And so then I took the grayscale values that she gave me and I found colors that do match that grayscale value, which you can see in the little thing below. And then we used those colors in the scene that you previously saw and some more photos that you're about to see to make the map and recolor it to draw attention to the right areas and match better cohesively. So how did we go about making the teleport animation for our red level? The problem given to me was this. I needed to animate a dot to follow a line and have it erase the line as it traveled. What I knew was that Unity's line renderer um, can draw a line using a list of point coordinates and a count of points, and these values can be accessed and modified in code. I also knew that the dotween animation library can change a value over time to make smoother animations. So to illustrate potential solutions, here's a simple line made of four points. Let's label them A through D. Um, our line starts at A near the player character, goes through B and C, and ends at D at a teleport crystal. To shorten this line, what we could do is remove A, shift B, C, and D over so that our line is now BCD. We can continue to do this, so our line is now CD after shifting C and D over. And we keep doing this until we end up with a single point. The problem with this solution is that it's a little inefficient because we're having to shift over every remaining point in the line at every step. This is fine for a line with just four points in it, but what about something like this? This is the solution that I ended up going with. Um, just as before, we start with A and end at D. But before we shorten our line, we swap the positions so that they're in reverse order. Um, so our line now starts at D, goes through C and B, and ends at A. This time around, since the point we're removing is at the end of the line, all we need to do to shorten the line is reduce the point count by one. This is a better solution since the positions are only swapped at the beginning, despite the extra step it takes to do so. This combined with Dotween's animation functionality gives us this, where the line disappears as the dot moves. Next, I'm gonna be talking about our blue level, which is about frogs, refraction, and catfish. 
So for this level, we wanted to take a more different approach than our traditional platforming elements. And I think one of the first things that came to mind, or one of the first things that I started to draw on the board for this level, um, was a frog for no reason in particular. And on top of that, I knew that I wanted our frog to talk because in fantasy worlds, thing talking, things talking makes everything better. So I started to write some silly little dialogue to fill it in. And I'm not sure why, but my brain switched to Spanish while I was writing these notes because I'm bilingual. and. That ended up being something that we kept in the game. I think it's important for representation to have languages that are not English represented as the default and to have English as our translation underneath in the dialogue boxes. Our frog serves as a friend, but he also serves as an obstacle. You have to go get his sombrero back in order to make him happy enough to move because right now he's in a little bit of a slump without his, um, his hat. Oh. Uh, this is the design of our level. Um, you have to shine a light into the water and it will refract and you have to guide a fish. Oh, um, uh, the animations are there. Um, but a fish that is that little white point at the top picture um, right above, the, in the very far right of it, um, that's uh, where the fish starts and you have to guide it to point B, which is where the sombrero is. You can see in our prototype level, there's not many obstacles nor many mirrors. There's only one or two solutions that you can really um, put in before you can finish the level. And we found that that wasn't interesting and it was also boring. So my team said, go crazy with it, add more stuff. So I did, I added more stuff. I added more obstacles, but I also didn't want to add obstacles and take away solutions. So I added more solutions. I put in more mirrors and now you can take uh, uh, multiple um, solutions to get to the very end. And I thought that made the level more fun. And it also gave the kids a way to express their creativity in figuring out how to get this fish um, to the sombrero in question. All right, so the art for this level, in the entire game, I try to make the art look like something that you would find in like a kid's storybook, because this is aimed for eight-year-olds. And also, in the context of the game, the game is told as our main character giving a presentation to his class of how he got back the colors. So I went with a very watercolor style for a lot of the art. And I also got to design even more characters for this uh, level. So we have Sapo, the frog, who Isabel just talked about. And I was inspired by how Isabel like, reflected her own culture in the frog. So for our catfish, I named him Leviathan Fischl. He speaks fishish, which is Yiddish for fish. Um, I'm Jewish myself, and so I made him an Ashkenazi catfish. And our final frog is Cupid, of unknown ethnicity and cultural background. But they, we named them Cupid because they have little Cupid wings on their butt and they can shine the mirror to help you reflect the light. This is, we also have Ronald Slide, who I will, I will be presenting for him. He coded Leviathan's little behaviors uh, so that when you have the light in front of Leviathan and he can see it and there's not like a rock in the way, he will follow and go to the light. But when he can't see the light, if it's behind a rock or if you just aren't shining it, he'll just swim around randomly without getting stuck in places. Yeah, and I'm gonna talk about our last but not least green level, which is about monkeys, total internal reflection, and also it is infamous along, um, among our team for being one of the hardest to design and make levels because in all frankness, we had no idea what this level was gonna look like and we had no idea where to go from our first two previous levels. Um, one of the issues with uh, our third level is that we needed a principle of light and the only one that we could really figure out how to visually represent was diffraction, which um, for those of you who don't know, diffraction is when light is shown through a slit and it'll appear as a pattern on a wall behind you. Um, our game is in 2D and it's kind of hard to represent uh, that kind of pattern and that kind of diffraction in a 2D context. So although the initial idea was to have you shine your light down a corridor and then have it diffract to light up the wall like next to you, this didn't really work in practice for a, a bunch of reasons. First of all, diffraction doesn't actually work like this. It's not a flashlight. Um, and physically it's just, it's hard to depict. So we had to, that was not gonna work. Um, we also had an issue where our obstacles were monkeys that swung from vines. And we realized none of our other critters in our levels are mean. And we didn't want mean monkeys to start that trend of mean animals. So we also had to scratch that. Um, and we also found that playing in the dark is really frustrating and difficult. And we didn't want our game to be frustrating and difficult. We had already started a trend of fun and silliness and we weren't gonna stop there. So, Nothing was really working about this level at all. 
And that mean we had to make the very difficult decision of starting a level and then completely scrapping it. Um, but our team, we, did, we all knew that was the best thing to do, so we did it. So I designed some of the monkeys for this level and I wanted, we, because we scrapped our original concept for the level, we had very little time to work on our second version. And in animation, when you have like a character running and stuff, every single frame is like a new drawing that you do from scratch. So I didn't have time to animate the monkeys running around rather than swinging on the vines. So we put them on skateboards because skateboards just go. And so we have a bunch of concept sketches here. The one in the top uh, left is from Isabel to from when originally the monkey was going to steal our thing. And the other ones are basic poses I drew. My team said which ones they liked. And then I, we eventually got this one on the final. Yeah, so I um, searched for and downloaded the sounds. Um, that often involved me um, ruling out the sounds that were copyrighted. And so I had to search specific websites that uh, didn't have copyright infringement um, issues. Um, so once I found something that I liked, I um, downloaded it and I usually trimmed it and edited it to make it in the appropriate style that uh, my team wanted. And so I like colluded with my team to make sure that they, they liked it and um, that I, I wanted to find the right style that would be good for the game. And I cataloged them for the copyright purposes and then I, um, yeah, that's what I did. Thanks. We'd just like to acknowledge all the people who made this possible, including um, our producer, coach, and mentors, and the invisible presence, um, and the invisible presence on our team. The invisible presence is my service dog, Minnie, who is not here today. But the joke is, if a service dog has their vest on, that's an invisibility cloak, so you don't see it. But she's there in our hearts. Any questions? Yes? What percentages of time did you spend on each level? Like, if you could break down your time into a pie chart, which That's a very interesting question. Um, I think that a majority of our time was probably spent on red because we were getting our bearings and sort of learning how to work as a team in general. Uh, Blue, we kind of worked in the sense that uh, some of us would start working on the next level while some of us were still wrapping up the first level. Um, I think green took the shortest amount of time, um, but that was not our choice. That was just we were running out of time and we still wanted to make that final level. Do you want to elaborate, Joshua, on like the programming? Or? No. Okay. <laughs> Question? I can draw frogs, so that's how we chose the frog, and I don't know. Uh, uh, for the catfish, because it's following a light, it's a catfish, and cats like to follow the little dots. The catfish will meow when it sees the light. As for monkeys, I really like chimpanzees. Monkeys are not chimpanzees, but people, like, we vibed with it. Primates in general love them. And for red, we didn't have time to include a critter, because that was something that we decided to include later. But we'll see, maybe in future versions, we can put in a little hedgehog that's on fire or something. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? OK, well, thank you for your time. All right, so that was amazing. All three teams, we are incredibly proud of you. That was really, really wonderful what you've done over the summer and your presentations as well. So just wanted to end with a few thank yous. Um, the coaches, uh, Emmett, Amkar, and Chris, you've done a wonderful job over the summer. Uh, the clients, Nick and Lisa and Alyssa, we are very grateful to you for giving your, your time and your thought to coming up with these projects. Um, our mentors uh, from Team2Bit and 
Ubisoft, thank you for volunteering your time to give advice to the interns and look at their resumes and answer questions and so forth from them. There's a number of um, UC uh, San Diego faculty and graduate students um, who are on this project, both helping out with the internship and on the research side, and our program evaluators. Um, and I also just want to add a few more thank yous. Um, so to the staff of QI, thank you very much for dealing with everything, the, you know, the catering, the room reservations, this whole uh, showcase event, everything from you know, the media team, the you know, computer support people, the events team, thank you. And plus, just as a surprise, the QI people made these t-shirts as souvenirs for our interns, so thank you for doing that. Um, we have our sister program at Northeastern, um, Leanne and Ara, thank you for everything you've done with collaborating um, with us on this. And I also want to just uh, thank our sponsors, um, it's a California Workforce Development Initiative and the National Science Foundation. I want to also tell you that we will be having this internship again next summer, both at UC San Diego and Northeastern. So please uh, spread the word. We will be hiring people to be coaches. We will be hiring interns. That will start happening around January, February. So please check our website for more information. And let me just say what happens now. Um, this is the end of the program. And outside, uh, there's a nice lunch for everybody. And at the same time, there's a room set up that way um, where you can try out all of the games and ask more questions of our interns. So please join us for lunch, join us for playing the games, and thank you very much everyone for being here. <laughs>